Hello, thanks for joining me. I know I stand between you and lunch, so I'll try to <laughs> stick to the time that I have. Um, my name is Valentina Laria and I work for PlumGrid. Um, and if you don't know PlumGrid, uh, we are a software fund networking company and we have a Neutron plugin and that's the end of the pitch. I'm not gonna talk product today. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I've been a member of the OpenStack community for a number of years. My first summit was the Santa Clara Summit, so it's pretty amazing to see uh, the evolution of us as a community. Uh, we have come a long way. Um, I've been very lucky to work with customers uh, since the early days of software-defined networks and OpenStack, helping them through you know, the, the deployments. So working with users as they learn how to leverage this technology, how to leverage the products that are part of the OpenStack ecosystem. Um, and I, you know, I do quite a bit of work with customers today in terms of helping them um, getting educated on the technology and how it works, um, what are some of the challenges and the architectural considerations that they need to go through um, as they consider adopting OpenStack in their, in their environments. Um, and you can find my content information there. Um, before we jump into the presentation, I want to get just a feel for how many of you have OpenStack deployed with um, either Nova Network or uh, Neutron today. Quite a few. So um, I'll try to take everybody else along and, uh, and you know, cut to the point of you know, making some interesting considerations here. I just want to know there, there's been so many interesting and great sessions around what is Neutron and Neutron 101 uh, throughout the week. So I'm going to try to give it a little bit of a different spin and talk about uh, architectural considerations throughout your design uh, phase. So just to get everybody on the same page, uh, obviously we're talking OpenStack, we've been here for four days, it's been a great summit, but um, I just wanna you know, put this one slide up one more time to remember all of you that what OpenStack is aiming at doing, and this is particularly true for the network component, is to provide an API, so an abstraction layer, that users, whether this user is a cloud operator or this user is a tenant, can then leverage to solve service provision resources. And this API should be able to abstract what the resource underneath is. Um, and this is particularly important for networking because there is so many implementations, and we're gonna touch you know, on, upon some of those, but there's so many different implementations of the actual backend. And it's fundamental that as a user, especially the tenant, so the end consumer of the cloud, is not exposed to that complexity. And they can just consume it as a very simple, self-service kind of model. Now, um, I've been working on networking for a, a number of years. Um, and, sorry about that, this slide is moving on me. Uh, I've been working on networking for a number of years, and you know, when I talk to customers, they ask me, why is it so complicated to actually get my network infrastructure up and running? Um, and you know, I was, I was talking with one of them um, a couple of weeks back and they were sharing with me that you know, whenever they need to bring up a new customer environment, um, it takes them anywhere you know, from like 60 to 80 tickets to be open. Um, so you know, imagine the process of getting, logging into whatever ticketing system they have and creating all these 75 tickets. And then somebody has to get in there and you know, process all of them and provision all the resources as the tickets request, um, and it takes them about four weeks to go through this process. And obviously, the ideal state is you know, what you see on, on the other side of this slide, which is being able to bring up the infrastructure that is needed for the tenants of a cloud in you know, zero tickets and zero time. Now, we all know that that doesn't exist, but we certainly want to converge that number. Uh, so what I'll try to cover today is how. How can we get there as a community and as users of OpenStack? So uh, when you look at leveraging OpenStack in your environment, um, you know, certainly you can go through your trials, POC, pilot kind of phases. And um, if you have a few, you know, very small number of nodes and servers, most of the options out there will probably work for you. Um, and so what I'm gonna try to concentrate on today instead is when you get to the peak of the mountain, when you get to the production phase of your cloud, what is it that you need to worry about? And it's quite different deploying four nodes to deploying a hundred or a thousand nodes in your cloud environment. Um, and so, you know, sometimes I talk to people and they're like, hey, you know, I, I brought up my cloud and I can do anything I want with four nodes. I'm like, is that a cloud? And no offense, but 
let's look at you know, what it takes to get to much larger numbers. Um, so a few things, you know, again, that I discuss with the users I work with on a daily basis is, you know, certainly as a first mandatory item is you're building a cloud environment. And cloud, by definition, means multi-tenant. So um, this, you know, obviously it's built into Neutron, and I'll touch upon how that's built, but that's a fundamental principle of your cloud infrastructure, being able to isolate effectively tenants Call it micro-segmentation, call it you know, virtual domains, call it tenant environments, call it logical networks, whatever it's the terminology that you want to use, but you want to make sure that the traffic from one tenant has nothing to do with the traffic from another tenant. And we'll talk about how Neutron achieves that and how Nova Networks achieves that as well. The second point becomes more and more relevant as you scale out your environment. What are the performance of the backend implementation that you're leveraging, how is it going to scale and change as you throw more nodes into your cloud? And the third bullet, it's something I'm particularly passionate about because that's a big transformation. High availability in this new cloud model of everything software defined, it's very, very different from what we're all used to in a hardware network model. So what are the principles of high availability? How does you know, the neutron abstraction help you with? And what are some of the considerations that you need to keep in mind as you evaluate different backend options? Extensibility. All of you today might have a specific set of use cases in mind, but you're building this crowd for the future. So how can you choose components that can be easily extended to enable you to then roll out new, new use cases on top of it. And last but not least, it's everything that has to do with a production environment, right? Is it stable? Can you troubleshoot it? I'm not going to touch upon the last two bullets, but I'll spend quite a bit of time on the performance and scale and the extensibility aspects. Now, before I jump into that, let me just take you through a journey, the journey of OpenStack networking. It all started with Nova Networks. Um, as you know, some of you that were part of the OpenStack community before the Folsom release know that there has been some functionality in terms of networking that has been present within the Nova project. So Nova is the compute aspect, right? Um, and until Folsom, that was the only option for defining and consuming network resources. Um, Nova has a let's call it a basic support for networking, and I'll elaborate more on what I mean by that. Um, and certainly, since the inception of Neutron, the development on the Nova front has lessened. It hasn't stopped, and that's a very important point that I want to cover. And as part of this summit, if you have, you know, um, if you have walked into any of the rooms where the design summit is happening, there has been a lot of discussion around the migration path. This has been a big topic for you know, a number of summits, how do we take users that are on Nova Networks today all the way to Neutron? So the first consideration that I want to make here is that um, there's certainly nothing wrong with starting with Nova Networks, uh, but what I want to help you with is to understand where Nova Network can take you and what Neutron is building on top of that. So the first model for Nova Network, uh, it's the very plain, vanilla, flat networking. Uh, now, this is certainly not something that I would ever recommend for uh, a cloud production environment uh, because the principle underneath is that you're just mapping everything into a shared segment, right? So it's great to get started, great, you know, great to learn about how everything works, but there's really no way for you to segment and isolate workloads in this environment. Whether it be you know, virtual machines, containers, bare metals, doesn't matter. This is a flat model, so you're stuck with, with just having everyone talk to everyone. The next step, which is something that it supported both in Nova Networks as well as obviously in Neutron, is the ability to isolate tenants, workloads once more, using VLANs. VLANs should be you know, a concept that is very familiar to all of you. It's you know, the ability to just logically carve your network into partitions, layer two segments that can then be used by different users of your infrastructure. Um, VLANs have to be configured on your physical network. So this is one of the big challenges as you start scaling and growing your infrastructure. 
uh, both from a scalability perspective as well as from, as an oper from an operational perspective of having to go and maintain and configure these VLANs everywhere in your network, meaning every switch, every router, the traffic will go through. If you want to isolate VM traffic, you're going to have to have this VLAN properly configured. Um, so this kind of you know, networking 1.0, and you know, if you're here and you've been exposed to some of the concepts of you know, kind of software-defined networks, uh, one of the big promises of that approach is to you know, take you past these limitation of VLANs and enable you to create multi-tenant constructs that are a lot more powerful, a lot more scalable, and allow your fabric, your physical network, to take you to you know, much larger deployments. There's nothing wrong once more to you know, start with this model. Just keep in mind that you know, VLANs have a limit. It's a hard limit. There's only 4,000. And you're going to have to deal with just keeping your physical network configuration in sync and taken care of throughout the, you know, um, your entire cloud deployment. Now, if you have taken a look at the recent user survey that came out on Monday, uh, or Tuesday, whenever it was Monday, um, there's a staggering 24% of users that is still using Nova networks. So um, it, it's important as a community that all of you is you know, actually familiar with Nova networks, how they work, what they can give you. Um, and the big question mark is how do we take these users forward? Um, so I find very intriguing that you know, um, pretty high numbers say, hey, you know, yeah, I'm, I will consider moving to Neutron once two things have to happen. One is there has to be a clear migration path. And two, there has to be a simplification of Neutron itself. Uh, so Neutron has been for a number of year, you know, number of releases, the number one concern for users are actually deploying an OpenStack cloud. So it's complex, it's hard to understand, there's a lot of moving parts, there's enhancements that have to come you know, uh, into the picture for it to become you know, easy to deploy in a production environment. But keep in mind again that you know, there is a very large number of users and some of you have probably heard of some of those. Some of the largest deployments are still running on Nova Networks. So don't underestimate the fact that that's certainly an option there. It wouldn't be my recommendation to start from Nova Networks. So if you're starting from scratch, if you're just embarking your journey uh, you know, in deploying an OpenStack cloud, you will certainly want to look at Neutron as, as your starting point. Uh, so Neutron was introduced with the Folsom release. Before that, as I said, it wasn't part of OpenStack. And its mandate from the very beginning was to deliver on the promise of network as a service. So the ability for tenants, cloud operators, to log into a dashboard, to use an API, to self-service provision network resources. It's a big mandate, and it's been, you know, there's been a, a huge effort from all of us as a community to deliver on that. The other mandate for, for Neutron was to be a technology agnostic layer. What it means is that Neutron promises to provide an API layer that abstracts network resources to such a simple concept that each and every one can consume those resources without having to worry about whether it's implemented using VNANs or overlay networks or whatever other magic, black magic you want to use under the covers. Okay? And this abstraction layer, it's important for each and every user because it gives you the ability to swap vendors in the back end. You have consistent API, consistent integration, and as you go through your evaluation of the different options, you can swap and replace components in the back end. And you see that each and every one of the options in the back end will give you different performance, different scales, different feature set. The other thing uh, for Neutron is that from the beginning, it was designed to not just provide the basic network functionalities of you know, layer two and layer three, but to um, allow users to define very rich and complex network topologies. Once more, because we want to enable each and every user to bring each and every kind of application into cloud. And you know, just a simple kind of Amazon model doesn't fit your enterprise application, doesn't fit your best practices of deploying applications on top of you know, uh, layer two, layer three, NAT, security, and so on and so forth. So Neutron from the beginning, promises to deliver not just the basic network functionalities, but advanced services. There's been a lot of changes around advanced services with Kilo, um, and I'm, I'm not going to cover much around what's, you know, what is changing in Kilo, 
uh, but there is you know, lots of references, and I'll you know, post my slides on LightShare, and there's, there's going to be a slide that points you to all the new features there, but certainly lots of changes happening around the advanced services area. Now, um, we talked about this already, but you know, just to uh, recap it once more, what is Neutron? It's an API layer. It's an API that allows you to manage network resources and allow for workloads to consume those resources. And those workloads can be virtual machines, they can be containers, they can be bare metal. There's obviously different integration models and your network layer should be able to span across each and every one of you. And you know, I mentioned earlier, the promise was to be technology agnostic and the modular design of Neutron is what allows this agno being agnostic and enabling each and every vendor to provide a solution in the back end. Uh, the third bullet point, it's the promise of multi-tenancy and isolation. So Neutron from the beginning was designed with multi-tenant constructs embedded. So the ability for tenants of a cloud to self-service provision an environment and not have to worry about is my IP address, oops, sorry guys, it's my IP address going to conflict with somebody else's IP address. It's your own bubble, it's your own private environment and you can do as you wish within that. So this is just you know, a reference architecture design of, of Neutron. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's really simple. Uh, there's a Neutron server that just really is you know, exposing the API layer to you know, whether it's a dashboard or directly the API to the user. And then under the covers, there's a plugin. And the plugin is how each vendor interacts and interfaces with Neutron. We'll talk a lot more about the different architectures and how different solutions in the backend um, change these kind of um, impact this design. Again, I'm not going to go into all the details of the different plugins, but I really like this slide. I really like this representation. Um, so as you can see here, uh, when you go and select plugins, there is tens and tens of plugins that are available today. Um, some of those are monolithic plugins. What it means is when you select one of these plugins, you just have kind of one backend that gets plugged into Neutron and that's going to be responsible for taking all the API calls that come from the top, from the dashboard or from the API itself and satisfy the creation of all the network resources that are needed for the workloads. The ML2 plugin instead, it's, it's a different, slightly different architecture where you can have multiple plugins that can coexist together. Um, use cases for this might be that you want to be able to control, uh, let's say, in a, um, you know, a KVM environment and a Hyper-V environment at the same time, or you might want to be able to control kind of your virtual network infrastructure, so your SDN layer, as well as your physical network infrastructure at the same time for some basic configuration maybe in the physical network and some more advanced configuration in the virtual network. And then you have the advanced services, whether it's your load balancer, your VPN, your firewall. Neutron from the beginning again has an architecture that allows for those advanced services to be consumed as part of these no, network creation from the tenant. Now, um, I get a lot of questions about, you know, is Neutron actually, you know, um, OBS, is Neutron, Neutron uh, implementing the layer two? Um, now, the way to think about Neutron is that, as I said probably too many times already, it's really just an abstraction layer. It's a very thin layer. And all it does is to pass whatever API call and definition you make down into the backend. So if your backend is an SDN kind of solution where you have a controller, what's going to happen is you're going to make an API call, the API call is going to go through the Neutron server, and it's going to get pushed down into the SDN controller. And that's where then things will get implemented. If you're using kind of OBS and the network node, then that's where the functionality will be implemented. Some of it will happen inside the compute node, some of it will happen in the network node itself. Um, now, where the confusion comes from is because there's some reference architectures that are built on, for example, OBS and the network node that you should look at and you should certainly use as a starting point. But that Neutron, again, it's vendor agnostic and you can use any backend implementation as you wish. 
Now, what can you do with Neutron? That's where it gets interesting, right? Um, so this is the representation of an OpenStack network. If you have ever, some of you that raised their hands and obviously have a deployment are very familiar with this. This is the dashboard horizon representation of a network in, in OpenStack. So each of these bar is a network. Um, and each of these bar represents you know, connectivity, whether it's internal connectivity between VMs that belong to the same tenant, as well as external connectivity. So here we have you know, a few internal networks, the web and the DB network, the green and the orange one that you see in this picture. And those are you know, networks that a tenant was able to create just by logging into the dashboard without any understanding of the backend implementation underneath. So they created these networks, they define a subnet for it, and what they can do is they can create, they can connect virtual machines to that network. Now once you have done that, once you have created your, your two networks, what you can do next is you can interconnect your networks. So in this example here, you see we have the green and the orange network, and then what the tenant decided to do was to interconnect them with a the router. So this is kind of you know, the simple abstraction the Neutron provides. And once you have defined your internal you know, topology, what the network looks like, the next step is to define what the external connectivity looks like. So you can say, oh, my tenant network wants to connect to the outside world. Now, this is where things get interesting, um, and uh, that's a whole topic of provider networks, uh, which you know, I'm very passionate about, and there's a lot of interesting things that you can do there, but uh, in, a, in a nutshell, the concept of provider networks is the ability for a tenant network to be connected with the external world. Now, if you look at this picture, this XNet that you see there, the blue one, it's actually something that the cloud operator will create. The cloud operator will define this external connectivity a construct that then the tenant can come and consume. So from an operational perspective, there is like a, an invisible boundary between the blue and the orange. Everything that is right of the router, it's owned by the tenant. Anything that is left of the router, it's owned by the cloud operator. But as you can see, the, 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 the abstraction model, it's extremely simple, extremely easy to consume. Now, let's talk backend for a second. Um, something that Neutron really enabled was for each and every user to consume software-defined networks, overlay models. As I said earlier, uh, the need for those new models comes from the limitations that are implicit in leveraging VLANs to isolate your infrastructure. So um, in an overlay model, what happens is that you are creating isolated environments by encapsulating frames, packets that come from the virtual machine into some form of tunnel, whether it's VXLAN, MVGRE, or whatever other tunnel you wish to use. This encapsulation provides the isolation and the segmentation between tenants. The beauty of this model is that because you're using an encapsulation, you are decoupling your logical virtual plane from your physical network. So every time a tenant comes into Horizon and consumes resources, they're doing something that is expressed in the virtual network. And your physical network, it's very stable um, and doesn't require too much changes, which is important for your business because changes are risky and you don't want to take down your network. All right? So this is how Neutron changes the rules of the game. Now, because of all these changes and all these you know, options in the back end, users ask me, okay, how do I go about evaluating scales and performance? What are the things that I need to keep in mind? Um, so I'm gonna quickly walk you through some of the considerations here, and I wanna make sure I leave some time for Q&A. A sure. Um, so when you talk about extensibility and performance, um, there's one piece of the puzzle that it's very important, and that's a data plane. So your data plane means quite a bit in terms of giving you different performance and scalability, all right? Uh, that's all right. Uh, so, you know, if you look at the different options that you have there, I like to put them on kind of an evolution scale because really they provide different set of functionalities. Um, so if you start from the left, you have kind of the concept of a vSwitch. You know, this is the concept of bringing the network layer all the way within your hypervisor and providing some layer two functionalities in software 
right within the kernel or the user space of a server so that VMs can interconnect and talk to each other without having to go into the physical infrastructure. Now, that's great, but what about, you know, what if I want to connect with a VM that sits on another server? That's where the concept of a distributed virtual switch comes into the picture. So the DV, DVS kind of construct is the ability to have a vSwitch that spans multiple physical servers. Very often, this spanning across physical servers comes in conjunction with the overlay model that I described previously. So the ability to stretch this layer to construct across your physical infrastructure. But hey, what if I want routing? Let's plug a router into it, right? And, and then you can evolve all the way to the place where you have kind of your entire logical topology that can be stretched across your physical infrastructure and can live across multiple servers. Now, there's been a lot of innovation in data planes, and, and this is really you know, what you need to look at. And there is more and more that is being done around building extensible data planes. And what I mean by that is the ability to have a programmable data plane where you can load dynamically new features and functionalities in there. So when you look at selecting um, different vendors, different options, whether it's vendors or open source, doesn't really matter there. Um, you should look at where do you want to be in this evolution. And each of those will give you a different set of features and more importantly, a different set of scalability properties and performance. Now, let me just give you an example. It's a very ugly representation, sorry about that, but it kind of um, you know, makes the point that I, that I want to bring here, which is if you look inside a compute node, and you break it in a very simplistic way into two parts. You have your kernel and your user space. Kernel fast, user space lower, all right? Now, when you look at where your functionality, network functionality, whether it's layer two or layer three or not, or security or whatever else lives, it can live in two places, one of two places, or a combination of two. It can live in the kernel, meaning that VMs will be able to switch traffic right you know, from a kernel perspective, or especially for higher functionality like layer three and NAT and security, it might live as a user space component. So to access that resource, the VM traffic needs to go through the kernel, up to the user space, back down to the kernel, back up to the VM. So much slower in terms of performance. So when you look at the different options, consider where the features and functionalities are implemented. And for some of the um, different implementations for Neutron and the references implementations that use network nodes, the functionalities that you have, whether it's layer two, layer three, the ACP, advanced services, are often implemented as agents. Those agents can live on the network node. Think about the network node as an additional network component which is deployed in a central location that can help you with the more advanced functionality or as agents inside each hypervisor, like the layer two agent. Now, why does this matter? The reason why it matters is because when you look at your virtual machine traffic, if you're leveraging agents, you're gonna look at some pretty odd behaviors where some of the traffic gets switched locally within a server, some of the traffic gets punted up all the way to the network node. Now, there's more and more improvements that are coming more and more and more at the, you know, advances in the architectures of the different solutions where a lot of these functions are getting pushed down into the servers itself, inside the kernel. But if you're using implementations where there is a component like the network node, what it's important to understand is that some of your data traffic will actually go up to that network node. So placement, sizing, bandwidth considerations are imperative when you look at deploying an infrastructure that has that. And as you scale out, the need for that network node will change. Now, if you're instead using a, an agent-less kind of implementation, which is um, for the most part the case where you're using, when you're using a SDN solution with a controller, what happens is most of those agents are gone. You're just gonna talk to the controller and say, hey, I need this network functionalities to be created for me. And then the controller will go and you know, kind of get it instantiated in the data planes. Now, assuming you're using a data plane that it's capable of giving you all the features and functionality, layer two to four, that you need for your applications, what's gonna happen is that 
the, the, the traffic between virtual machines will be all local within each server. And because all the features and functionality live within each compute node, as you add more of those compute nodes, your network functionality would just automatically scale out and extend from one server to four to 10 to 50 to 100 and beyond. And there's, the network node doesn't exist anymore and you're just you know, looking at having um, kind of a controller which only hosts management and control plane functionality and has nothing to do with you know, data plane traffic. So the sizing, the placement changes drastically and you can look at deploying that controller in a management rack and have higher you know, security around it. You can deploy it as a container, an LXC kind of you know, container within, uh, within the OpenStack controller itself and so on and so forth. So a lot more flexibility and a much better design because you can just automatically scale out your infrastructure by adding more servers into it. All right, now the last point that I want to make and then I'll wrap up quickly it's around high availability. When you move, and again, today I've been you know, concentrating mostly you know, on this software model of delivering networks, which is what Neutron really unleashes and enables, right? But when you move from consuming networks in hardware to consuming networks in software, the high availability model, it's probably the one that it's the most impacted. All of us are familiar with how you can make a network highly available. You have a bunch of links and redundant, you know, if you have a modular switch, you have redundant supervisors, and if you have a Tor, you have dual Tors, and so on and so forth, Nick bonding, and yada, 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 right? All things that we very well understand. But what if you move to this software model? When you move to the software model, that's where you start looking at making the control plane and the data plane components are highly available, right? So, um, and again, we're not going to have the time to go, go through each and every of those, but the idea is that you want to look at how to have a control plane that it's self-healing and redundant, so that even if something fails, it's going to be able to come back online and keep all the state. You want to look at having a data plane that is capable of you know, non-stop forwarding. What I mean is you chuck the head out, data plane still sends packets. If you're using some form of overlay, you're, you always have kind of a translation point from virtual to physical, and that's the concept of a gateway. So how do you make this translation point highly redundant, highly available? And then what if something happens in my OpenStack controller, in my cloud management system? How am I gonna interact with failures with that layer? So you see that the, you know, the HA considerations are very, very different when you talk virtual versus physical. All right, uh, so this is just you know, kind of a summary of what I just discussed with you know, the ability for the control plane to recover, for the data plane to be independently capable of forwarding packets, and just an overall system that it's capable of recovering from failures. So what next? The OpenStack networking journey, it's, it's a long journey, and you know, I myself keep learning every day. So, I personally spend quite a bit of time, as I mentioned at the beginning, just educating users. Um, and if you haven't, you should go and check the OpenStack Marketplace and the training tab. There is a lot of very interesting trainings there that you can consume, some for free, some you, know, you pay for it, but it's, it's a great resource for anyone that is starting down the journey of OpenStack, as well as for those that are pretty familiar with it. Um, we personally help users get started just by providing some you know, hands-on environments um, in the cloud. So if you, if you just wanna learn about OpenStack networking, you know, come see me and I can help you get one of those going um, and just play with some of those constructs that we have just discussed. I highly recommend getting your hands on an OpenStack environment. Theory is great. Hands-on for me is the most important thing ever. And obviously, this is my content information, and I'm happy to you know, answer any question and continue the dialogue here. Oh, I made it with six minutes left. <sighs> awesome. So um, any question, comment? Anybody that wants to share what was your journey getting you know, through, through the selection process and understanding how to design your OpenStack network? There's a mic there. Don't be shy. Nothing. All right. 
Then thanks for coming. <laughs>